Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for, uh, for sticking around here. Uh, we're going to have a very interesting conversation about how tech, or how tech, how green is tech, really. And I'm going to be... Um, I'm going to break with convention of the day ever so slightly before we have a conversation, because I'd like to show you the results of a rather loud and uh, definitive Twitter poll result, which we're going to pull up. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. Um, do you believe most tech companies are as green as they say they are? Uh, the answer is 93.5% no, which is a pretty definitive response, pretty loud. Um, I do usually find it's a good experiment on social media when you need advice, is to ask what the very loudest people think you should do and then do the opposite. Um, so on this occasion, I'd like to run the poll again with everyone in here and who's watching online, just to see if your opinion on this answer um, differs. So it's the same. Um, OK, it's a slightly different question, but uh, it's still a yes or no answer. So if you fancy voting on this, we'll talk about it. But in the short term, um, Ellen and Sophie, it's great to have you here. Um, I just wondered if first you could give us a, a sense of um, what your companies do and then your initial re thought, uh, reactions to the rather clear answer that our Twitter users uh, gave us. So Ellen, we'll start with you. Happy to. Um, uh, I lead the European business for Watershed, which is a technology company that helps medium and large businesses run their end-to-end -end climate program everything through understanding where their emissions lie, to acting on those emissions, reducing those emissions, um, and then ultimately reporting and being transparent about that as well. Um, happy, to, happy to give kind of a, a quick take on that, and then I'll hand it over to Sophie as well. I think I would say, maybe to the tech question, inherently tech, like many other industries, has very non-green elements of it. And one size, it's not created equal across all tech businesses as well, I should say. There are choices within every business on how green they want to be. And I'd say transparency is really important um, to consumers, to stakeholders to help them understand that. Example of that is, let's say, data centers, for example. Most tech companies have big data center footprints. There's a lot of choices they can make on whether it's on-prem or colo or in the cloud, where the grid is. And a lot of that can actually um, impact actually how green that part of their emissions are or actually how they run their processing. So that's just one example of many, but um, it really depends. And I'll say it's very business to business. And we encourage a lot of transparency around that such that as a consumer, you'd have a better sense of how to answer that question for that very reason. And Sophie, what, Ecosia. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Ecosia, lots of you might know Ecosia as a search engine that plants trees. We do quite a lot more than, than that um, at this point now, kind of 12, 13 years on down that, that path. Um, and no doubt we'll kind of cover those things during this session. But um, I, I run the UK um, for Ecosia and also the policy piece, which involves tech and climate policy, uh, given that we're a search engine and we plant trees. Anyway, we'll come to that. Um, to, to, this, to this question, I mean, I, I, I'm not surprised. Um, and and as, as Ellen was saying, I mean, essentially, um, every company, no matter which business you're in, which, which sector you're in, has a responsibility to be as, as green um, as, as possible. Um, every company has the values that the company sets. And uh, I kind of say, you know, everyone has their cause and context, right? So you, if you're in the tech sector like we are, you're inherently involved in the ICT sector. We just were looking at hearing about the kind of the carbon emissions of that sector. And therefore, we have a responsibility to engage with that responsibly, to take the right steps to, to mitigate the carbon from that and we have been, and we're 200% we're energy renewable at this point, so we're carbon negative and have been for a long time. So we've, we've taken that as part of the kind of the values that drive the company uh, kind of very seriously early on. Um, and, and yeah, so I think that that's important for, for companies to consider. Um, but then on top of that, obviously, there's, there's regulation that can help with that, right? That number's pretty high, I think it's 93%. So I think there's clearly a bit of a gap in terms of expectations of what employers are, employees are looking for from their employer mm -hmm. and what actually the employer is delivering. Well, let's have a look at the result of our live poll. Um, so this is a slightly less uh, extreme uh, answer, but uh, it's still a pretty resounding no. Uh, you do not believe your employer or business does enough to combat, uh, to control environmental impact. So um, it's a very similar set of answers from both of those, um, both of those questions. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty then, um, Sophie, can you just explain to me, when I'm searching on Ecosia, mm -hmm. I am an Ecosia user, how exactly are all my searches translating into trees going in yeah. the ground? Like, how do you do that and compete with Google? 
which is a pretty big. Right. I mean, it's very hard to, to compete with, with Google. I mean, Google um, owns 96% of the European search market, right? So uh, that, that's a tough, tough one to crack. Um, but we're doing pretty well. We have 20 million users across Europe and the US largely, but elsewhere too. Um, and in terms of kind of those users, why they're using Ecosia, I mean, they, they fundamentally uh, are very concerned about uh, climate change. So in terms of competing with Google, I mean, we have uh, a value proposition which, um, you know, really speaks to people who are, who are worried and also are looking for a way of making a, uh, a difference. It's free, it's accessible. You just need uh, internet access. So that speaks to a lot of people who are desperate to do something. And we see that number rise as, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, climate disasters increase. Unfortunately, we see people you know, uh, coming to Ecosia more and more, which is, which is good for us, but obviously it, it, it reflects a, a wider problem. Um, so in terms of how, how Ecosia works, I mean, uh, transparency is incredibly important for us. So um, if anyone, and I would encourage anyone who doesn't use Ecosia to quickly go on, on the, uh, the App Store and, and download, and you can see as I'm, as I'm talking what I'm talking about. But we have a large number, which now sits at over 157 million trees, which goes up um, as more and more users uh, use Ecosia and click on ads. And it's an imperfect system that we've built Ecosia on, right? The idea of clicking on ads and consuming, um, but uh, that is the challenge of the search markets uh, space, right? So we can talk a bit more about those challenges, obviously. But Ecosia was created um, uh, to basically create a scalable revenue stream so that we could contribute to reforesting the planet. So we sit upon uh, the Bing infrastructure, and all of the money that is uh, generated through ads goes into fighting climate change. 80% has always been signposted for reforestation uh, projects, so we're one of the largest reforestation organizations in the world, which is great. Um, and the remaining 20% goes into other uh, exciting initiatives like renewables, like regenerative agriculture investments, and a few other different fund projects that we're involved in. But the idea is that we are using a, a business model, a search engine, uh, and, and kind of putting all of that uh, revenue into, um, uh, all the profits into to fighting climate change. So, yeah. So instead of keeping the ad money, the ad money is going towards planting trees? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, Ellen, you come from the, from a, a, the other side of this um, in terms of working with companies that have maybe not uh, put climate and green credentials at the heart of their business, um, but want to, and help them figure out where those emissions are and how to offset them or get rid of them completely. Could you just talk us through a little bit about what the average process there, there looks like and, and where some of the stumbling blocks are um, with some of the businesses you work with? Yeah, I'll say it sort of, it starts with the data. It all comes down to data at the end. It's, that's the kind of critical piece to understanding where your emissions lie. And so when we begin working with a business across uh, many different types of industries, what we first do is work with them on actually ingesting that data, taking it from primary sources where we can. So we're really getting back to kind of where it's, where it's most raw and where it's most accurate. And then using that to actually identify where, you know, what that means in terms of their total emissions. And so we have a climate science team internally, and uh, that's all the methodology that we use. We make that methodology very transparent to our customers. So they can follow along on that journey. And then it's ultimately giving them a picture of what those emissions look like and where they lie. And once you have that, that's when you can start taking action. We often find that customers come to us thinking their emissions are going to lie in one place and being quite surprised, actually, where there are hot spots of emissions within their business, an example of that, we work with Monzo here in the UK. They weren't thinking about payment processing as a place that actually housed a lot of their emissions as a business. But once they were able to figure that out, they were then able to do something about that. And that can look like engaging with different vendors, um, working with them directly to reduce those emissions or get them to get a program in place, um, or in some cases looking at removals as an option um, or avoidance credits as well. Um, so I think once you can follow that data, which is really where we start with businesses, that's where the action can come. And then once that's done as well, it's an ongoing basis, I should say, you can then start to report on that and produce that kind of transparency effort that we spoke about earlier. And that's interesting because in the, uh, in the, first, the first slide we saw, the, the 90 odd percent of people who, who think companies aren't as green as they say they are, um, it may not be because those companies are lying. They might just be wrong. Mm -hmm. And they actually think, well, we thought we were doing a good job. And they come to a company like Watershed and you say, well, no, you are completely wrong because this is where it's all coming from. Mm -hmm. Do you find that is consistently the case, that companies are completely wrong about where the problem lies? Not always. I think there are, we work with wonderful sustainability teams and companies who've been thinking about this for a while and, and have been thinking deeply about the data. Mm -hmm. But there are often surprises. And also, as a business grows, there's going to be changes in the business that are going to impact their emissions as well. So 
whether that be an acquisition or a new business line or a country expansion, and navigating emissions that way can be challenging unless you've got sort of support behind you and understanding grid factors and uh, downstream supply chain elements that can actually contribute to that. So I'd say it's an ongoing effort, and that's why it can't just be a sort of look at this once a year and then get off to the races. It needs to be something that is very much integrated into the everyday practices of a business. Now, you mentioned uh, transparency earlier, mm. Sophie. And one of the things that intrigued me when we were speaking ahead of this panel is you said the most popular piece of content that Ecosia publishes every month is a pretty granular breakdown of how yeah. much money you've made and where you're spending it. Yeah. Um, in a very different way to you know, a, a quarterly or annual report that a, that a public company would have to do. Why do you think that is? And, and, and what is it about the transparency there that, that keeps people wanting to read that? Yeah. Um, I mean, our users are incredibly engaged with, with the product. Um, and when you, you were talking about the little tree counter that you get at the top, um, for lots of people, they really consider those to be their trees. Like, I think, um, you know, if you have kind of upwards of 100, 200, whatever trees, you know, people love to see the number go up and they want to know where those trees are actually being planted. So storytelling and helping to bring people along with the journey is really fundamental to Ecosia. It also makes us very different to other kind of tech companies, I would say, in terms of kind of, we're very, um, you, you see a lot of the, the characters in terms of the people actually you know, planting the trees, uh, employees, et cetera, on the, on the kind of content that we put out. So we're very much kind of a personable kind of company. Um, and in terms of the monthly reports, we've been doing them really from the offset. So we really wanted to ensure that transparency was ingra ingrained within the business model. Um, and it is, it is amazing to see that that is consistently still, despite all the, the kind of the videos that we put out, all of the you know stuff on social media, that is the thing that people um, are interested in, and they're also interested to see that you know we, as much as our tree number goes up, it also goes down sometimes. We're really uh, kind of uh, for us, the tree survival rate is one of the most important things, right? We're not just planting trees. The trees need to survive, and as the, the science changes as well, we are there making adjustments and making sure that it's accurate and reflective of what's happening on the ground. So we have a, a, a tree team which goes out and kind of looks at all the projects and, and checks what's check, check you know that everything on the ground is is correct, and then we adjust the tree counter accordingly. So so for us, integrity, transparency, knowing that things are a moving target. We're planting lots of trees, but they need to survive. We're kind of reflecting that in our storytelling. Also, it helps with accountability as well. It keeps us true to our mission and it keeps users along with us as well. So that's probably why it's one of the most kind of read pieces for us. But yeah, users really enjoy uh, interacting with that content and seeing where the money's going, which tr tree planting projects the, tr the, the, the money's going into. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely with the, with the trees, it's, it's quite nice for me to know that you know, the heavy metal drummers of the early 90s and the searches about them that I've made have gone some way to yeah. solving exactly. deforestation. Um, <laughs> but the, um, the other side of this is, is, as you say, is this accountability and this keeping the, um, uh, sort of the, the, the impetus up. And you must, um, Ellen, give companies reports or, or give them the, the, the tools to make reports about how they're improving or if they're improving. Yeah. Do you have conversations with them about whether or not they should be publishing those, um, perhaps in a similar way to, to, to Ecosia, not in a way that violates any uh, you know, regulatory issue they might have, but is that a conversation you have? And if so, how does that go? Absolutely, and I would just say, to kind of to build on that, I think what you say on the engagement you see mm -hmm. from your community, and I think this is true for companies needing to report for investors or their customers as well, um, that kind of engagement we're seeing only continue to increase. And we very much encourage our customers to report, um, to be transparent on that reporting. Now there's kind of a, a lot of companies today that are starting to do this on a voluntary basis and there are voluntary disclosure schemes that many of our customers choose to report to for that reason. Mm. Um, and also we see the kind of incoming policy that is going to be requiring this for many businesses as well. I think both, both those forces are important and they are beneficial. And we tell our customers, report as much as possible, be as transparent as possible, be clear on the methodology, let us arm you with how we got to these numbers with you. Because exactly as you say, the science year and year is going to evolve. And it's important to just be transparent on how that's ending, impacting ultimately your business as well. Um, and you want to be up to date with the, near, the newest methodology. And that's a lot of the role that we play with our climate science team with our customers. And so. I'd say it doesn't stop at just kind of doing things internally. It also is something to engage investors. It engages employees. Um, it engages prospective employees as well. And so it's absolutely sort of a big focus for us as we work with customers. And how is the regulatory, the change, if you like, in the regulatory landscape uh, over the last 10, 15 years affected 
um, how you talk to companies um, in terms of reporting? Like, ha has it made it easier for you to convince them to publish, knowing that maybe it'll help with, I don't know, tender proposals or, 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 whatever, or whatever else? It, it absolutely has, and I think there's, there's some unification around reporting that is very helpful, right? It's, it's difficult if everyone is reporting in a very different way, and so we are optimistic that as some of these disclosure schemes are starting to unify around certain standards, that's going to be very helpful for comparing apples to apples across companies. I think today that's still very, very challenging um, for the average person, really for anyone, to be able to compare across businesses. So I think that is a, a very helpful mechanism that is, that is definitely coming into effect. Okay. Um, Sophie, tell me what, I mean, you, how long has Ecosi been around now? 12, 13 yeah. years, something, something like yeah, that? Something so like that, yeah. You're doing something right, because you're competing with Google and you're still in business and you're still doing good things. What is what you've done so far allowing you to now think about doing over the next few years, next three, mm. five years? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, I mean, lots of people will know us as the search engine that plants trees, but we are also many other things. Um, we're the largest European search engine. We're the largest nonprofit search engine. We're also we also now have a um, a, a tech a climate tech VC, which has become the largest in, in Europe, the World Fund, which is fantastic. And so I spoke about the kind of the 80 percent always going into reforestation uh, projects, which makes us one of the largest reforestation movements in the world, which is awesome. Um, the, re the remaining 20% um, has been used for a number of different things. We've got a regenerative agriculture fund, one of the largest, uh, as you all know, one of the largest uh, causes of, of deforestation, which is incredibly important to us, right? There's no point in us planting trees when other people are kind of ripping them out with the other hand. Um, so um, uh, so uh, com uh, commercial agriculture is something we're really interested in kind of moving the system towards a regenerative agriculture. So we're, we're doing a number of different things. And one of the other areas that we, we work a lot on in terms of kind of also as an ICT company looking at our own carbon footprint is the uh, the renewable sector. So the um, uh, we've been using solar for a long time um, in, in Germany. Um, we've built a number of plants there, which is great. Um, we've built uh, we've 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 spent seven million on that, which um, as a startup initially um, uh, was quite a big investment for us. And then we have invested a, th a further 30 million when Russia invaded Ukraine into um, uh, solar energy in Germany to help to try to drive that green energy transition in Germany away from um, fossil fuel dependency. And also in the UK, um, we, we are now going to be announcing as well further investments in the renewable sector here. So we're, we're looking to invest um, uh, about a quarter of a million euros in uh, the renewable sector here in, in, um, uh, in the UK, which is fantastic. So we're really excited about that. And we want other companies to come along with us, right? I mean, Ecosia um, has planted a lot of trees and it's having a bit of an impact, which is great, but we can't do this by ourselves. We've spoken, others have spoken about kind of the need to have others join and, and come along with us on that journey. So partnerships are really important with other organizations who feel also compelled to do something to, to invest in that transition. So we'd love to, to work with other organizations who also want to, to invest in um, renewable energy um, uh, across the UK and elsewhere as well. So, so there's a few different projects, and, and um, we're definitely trying to fight climate change on, on a number of different fronts. Mm. Well, we've had um, a couple of questions that, that came in. Um, we've got another five minutes or so to talk. Um, one of them that I can, I can see here um, that I'm going to put to you, can consumerism and population growth ever be positively reconciled with environmentalism? Now, that's an easy question for four <laughs> minutes in a tech uh, conference to answer, but can it? Yes, no. I'm, I, I mean, uh, that's a really difficult one. To, I mean, there's a lot of things in there. It's quite a loaded question. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, as I said earlier, right, our um, business model, unfortunately, does require people to buy things, right? And then with that, we're, 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 being, we're doing something which is good for the environment. I mean, the, the current system needs to move away from extractive capitalism, I would say, right? We need to move towards something which is much more inclusive. We need a just transition. We need to make sure that everyone comes along with us on this journey. Um, so, so fundamentally, I mean, there's, there's a lot in there, but, but we need to move towards something which is much more sustainable and inclusive. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, Ellen, did you have a, a comment on that? No, I think it is obviously a big question. I think that there are choices in how consumerism op um, operates. And also, I think as you're using funding to invest in technologies that are going to be tr critical for this transition, I think as Ecosia is doing, or as we've seen other tech companies, the likes of kind of what Stripe and others have done on investing heavily in kind of forward buying on carbon removals, 
you know, that's coming from an era of actually making revenue on consumerism, but it's investing it in technologies. And so seeing more companies actually start to invest there, I think, is encouraging. But the outcome of that question, I think, will there's, there's a lot there and a lot remains to be seen. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to, to, to get to is, um, is to figure out how you maintain that inertia. I mean, obviously, um, Sophie, you mentioned that you, you tend to get an uptick when there have been uh, natural disasters, mm -hmm. people um, obviously concerned about environmental impact, want to do something, Ecosia is you know, one of the choices that they make uh, to, to, to sort of make a difference bit by bit. Um, and, and Ellen, in your conversations with companies, sometimes the data show that, yes, you need to do this, this, and this. And in the first instance, it might be easy enough to get those conversations going, but how do you keep people engaged and actually wanting to continue making a difference? Um, and not just being a box ticking exercise. How, is, is there a lesson that you can teach us? Yeah, I'm happy, happy to start there. I think the, the big piece on this, I think, is also helping companies frame this not just as a box ticking exercise or even just an altruistic thing, but there actually being some real ROI, some real return on investment from investing in strong sustainability, strong climate programs. I mean, this can help with things like logistics optimization that can actually help the bottom line or uh, helping on kind of travel optimization that can, uh, that can improve the bottom line. We see investors wanting to pay premiums for companies that actually have really strong programs in this place so it can really help with getting funding in certain cases as well. Um, then there's sort of this less quantifiable around employee engagement and attraction that I mentioned earlier. And so it's going to look slightly different for every business, but um, it, it is not just a box checking exercise, and if anything, we actually see a huge amount of value coming from many of the businesses that end up engaging quite deeply here. And being able to show that data over time, I think is gonna be a critical component, and that's where things like software and pulling that actually into everyday business practices, and not just sitting in a little corner of a business, is gonna be really critical for that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Sophie, how do you how do you maintain that interest? How do you how do you keep people coming back once they've discovered that they can use you? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's not a lack of concern around the environment, right? I mean, we're a B two C company. Um, we go straight to the consumers, the, the users of the internet um, are concerned about the environment, and they come to us. Um, and I mean, in, in some ways, it's almost the opposite. Um, a lot of our users are kind of under the age of 40, 45, and are incredibly worried to the point that they have, you know, climate anxiety. And um, uh, and and we do a lot of content to to try to help people through that, right? Because this is a, a marathon; it's not a sprint. So it's more like, how do you prevent the overwhelm, and how do you make sustainable choices, um, uh, which are integrated within your life, um, you know, to, to to which align with your values. And for a lot of people, Ecosia is a way of, of doing that without making too much of a change. Um, so I think, yeah, we almost have the kind of the opposite problem, right? How do, we, how do we look after our users? How do we make sure that they're getting the, the information they need and that they feel empowered, A, to make greener choices? So we have greener kind of products and ways that you can, uh, when you use Ecosia, kind of differentiate between uh, different things that you might be shopping for, et cetera. Um, and also just making sure that they have the information about how to perhaps um, direct their climate um, action as well. Well, Ellen, uh, Sophie, it's been absolutely fascinating. We are sadly out of time, um, but thank you for joining us today, and thank you, everybody, for, for attending or for watching online. Thank you both.